Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Dan Lynch joins me. We're going to be talking to our Randy Harper, our own Randy Harper, about the Online Abuse Prevention Initiative. Very, very important stuff. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. <laughs> This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Dan Lynch. Episode 331, recorded April 8th, 2015. The Online Abuse Prevention Initiative. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, Libre, open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at StoneEdge.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the little projects, projects you may be using every day, projects you may not have ever heard about, but now, right after the show, want to go find out more about. Uh, this week, I'm joined by Dan Lynch. Welcome back to the show. Sorry. Hey, it's always good to be here. The first rule of podcasting, unmute your mic if you're going to talk to somebody. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, it's great to be back. Indeed, indeed. And for those of you who are seeing the background in the video, I am back at ZipRecruiter. The nice green tree is back there behind me. And this also means I will not be banned with Challenge this week, which is pretty decent down in Santa Monica, of course, uh, working here for many, many months now for this client. And also, uh, Dan, where are we speaking to you? Where are you speaking to us from? I always get that backwards. <laughs> Yeah, I'm in, uh, in I'm uh, safely tucked away in my my little back cave here in in Liverpool in the northwest of England, uh, just Indeed. across the uh, the pond from you. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And uh, so this week we have a somewhat unusual show. Uh, for one, the uh, guest this week is a frequent co-host of this show, Randy Harper, also known as FreeBSD Girl. And she's coming back as a guest to talk to us about her new project. It's called the Online Abuse Prevention Initiative. Now, this is a organization uh, that is set out to try to uh, mitigate or, or, or sort of figure out how to reduce the amount of uh, online bullying and, and, and uh, all sorts of other things related to that. I don't know the entire scope of it, but that's why we have Randy coming in in a few minutes to talk about that. But this came out of uh, her work with the whole Gamergate thing. And unfortunately, I don't know much about that either. But like, you know, I have a very good expert that's coming on in a few minutes to talk about that. Uh, Gamergate triggered a lot of uh, online abuse going on. And uh, Randy was noticing that uh, you know, there was a lot of people getting uh, messed up. So she did. She took action. She worked out a uh, Twitter bot that would actually figure out who sort of is abusing the most on with these through the Gamergate stuff and would add them automatically to a um, block list that people could subscribe to. Now, about a thousand people are subscribed to it right now, and that means that if you're on this block list, those thousand people by choice are not re receiving your material. Some of the controversy comes about though because you only have to be interested in following some of these Gamergate people uh, to get on the list, except there is a nice whitelisting process that uh, takes uh, takes precedence. So uh, you have to know that you're being blocked, though. So that's the way it works. Um, uh, I've just been whispering my ear that it's actually 3,000 people are now using the blocker list. Um, but anyway, uh, what do you know about this so far, Dan? Yeah, I, uh, obviously it's a, a huge subject and um, obviously a controversial one in, in a lot of quarters. Um, I did follow a lot of the Gamergate stuff last year, although my knowledge is a little bit out of date on that. But uh, it seems like a really important cause and I think uh, something that we should definitely find out more about and, uh, and try and support if we can. Well, without further ado, let's go ahead and bring on Randy. Randy Harper, welcome back to the show. Hey, it's awesome to be back and really weird to be back on this side of the conversation. It's been like five years since I've been here. As far yeah. as being a guest. Well, I think you were sort mm -hmm. of a guest on the uh, Cake PHP show, the one I didn't host. So um, I think that was not a matter of two co-hosts. I think it was just you and, and, and Aaron, right? Well, a co-host, yeah. But I mean, like actually being the, the target 
being interviewed. <laughs> the the target, target, the target wow. unfortunately, is a bad choice of words here. So, uh, so let's. Uh, so, uh, like I said, I want to talk about GamerGate first, so we can kind of see the, the background and motivation for that. Might uh, detour a little bit into just what happens in general. Uh, you know, women in tech and and a lot of the ways that people get harassed and stuff like that. But I really want to ultimately get all the way up to the online uh, initiative, the online uh, abuse prevention initiative. So, why don't you start and give us sort of the, the background for somebody who's never heard of GamerGate? What What's the what's the you know, the, the, the two minute introduction to it? So you've probably heard of it being talked about as being like ethics and games journalism. The truth is, this actually started as an attack on a woman who is a game developer, Zoe Quinn, and she's a friend of mine. I actually met her after all of this happened when I started seeing her tweeting about like some of the threats she was getting, and I started looking into the situation more. And it's actually one of the worst breakups I have ever heard of. It's this abusive ex-boyfriend who started all of this. He made this blog post about, you know, certain allegations about Zoe's sex life, saying that she had, you know, had a relationship with a journalist. And this kind of just spun into all of this. I mean, it's all coming out of this one abusive ex. And it's just possibly the worst breakup. I I can't even imagine having to deal with this. So Zoe is still going through a lot. And plus she has all of these people coming at her now, these gamer gators who are constantly telling her, you know, you're not actually like writing games or, you know, you did things for this review. And that's not really the case. And since then, it's really spun more and more into this hugely misogynistic movement where they're going out and targeting women. So they targeted Brianna Wu, another person who she owns her own game company, and she's creating games. Games. And they targeted Anita Sarkeesian, who was creating videos about, you know, uh, female tropes in gaming culture and in video games. And then I got involved, <laughs> which was very enlightening. And that's whenever I started tweeting about how, you know, when women say they're getting threats on the Internet, we should probably believe them because it happens all of the time. And when I did that, I got thousands of tweets that night sent at me from Gamergate. I ended up sitting in my bed at like three in the morning talking to Adam Baldwin, which was really surreal. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's, well, it's this also, huge disaster. Can I, can I, can I, I can interrupt here for a second? Because uh, now you're talking about threats. We aren't just talking about people may, being noisy around other people, you know, just basically putting in lots of tweets and, and maybe like DDoSing by having hundreds of people put tweets in and, and, and distract them. You're talking about people in that conversation actually physically threatening uh, uh, the, the targets? Um, well, a lot of people, you know, they have issued like rape threats and death threats and pretty much general threats of violence. Um, but we've had people, like somebody actually called in a bomb threat on Anita Sarkeesian when she was going to be speaking at a conference. And then I've had people show up at my office before and take a selfie outside so they could post it on Twitter to the Gamergate hashtag and be like, look whose office I was at, repeatedly posting like maps to where I worked. Um, I've had people say they were hiring like PIs to watch me. So they wanted to pull up any information they could on me. And they do intend to keep you actually, you know, quiet. They want to keep you quiet and they want to keep you scared. And this does very much reflect on real life. I mean, it's not just the Internet. So this uh, essentially has a chilling effect because uh, for the people who might be threatened or the people who have been threatened, they're less likely to speak out more about it or like likely to even uh, participate in in, uh, in online conversations, things like that. Would that might be a fair assessment? Oh, definitely. And that's not even just Gamergate necessarily. We've been seeing this happening in the industry for a long time. I mean, women have been leaving the industry in droves and... So finally, quite a few women are coming out and trying to tell their stories. Because uh, when all this happened to me, um, a bunch of previous V developers contacted me and they're like, this is crazy. Is this a thing that actually happens? And I looked at them and I was like, are you serious? Like, this happens to everybody. Every woman has received a threat on the Internet at some point. A lot of women have received more than one. Wow! Wow! That's uh, that's uh, that's uh, you know I've I've been following for years uh, the the whole conversation about women in tech because you know I I look around my coworkers and stuff then it, it's you know it's 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 clearly a male dominated field and uh, I, unfortunately I can't see I identify with being the opposite sex very much except what, what I, I hear all the time uh, I I also wanted to add as in terms of threats uh, you had a recent event that was a physical threat uh, just a couple of days ago right. 
I did. Um, so I was actually sitting at my computer desk right here, and it was kind of late at night. It was about 10 o'clock. I was playing some video games. I had just stopped playing video games, and I was tweeting about how I was playing these games. And typically I stream. Um, I wasn't that night. But about 10.20, when I had finished, I got a knock on my door. And when this happened, I knew exactly what it was because I am in a pretty secure building. I mean, you have to like, I have to swipe my keys three times to get up to my apartment. Um, there's security, the patrols, especially since all of this started, they patrol my building more now. So I was like, okay, nobody's going to be coming up to my apartment. Clearly this is the police. And I opened up the door and it was, and somebody had actually called in a fake ransom uh, saying that I had somebody, I was holding them for ransom for $10,000. The goal of this was to get a SWAT team to descend on my apartment. And this has happened numerous times to people that have been speaking out about online harassment. It, it's happened a lot prior to that, but we're seeing the pays really, really pick up. It's specifically targeting women, although there's quite a few men who have been targeted as well. And it's it's basically attempted murder by a cop because you hear these stories of, of SWAT teams that are busting into apartments and they kill dogs, they've hurt people. And I was lucky. Um, I knew this was coming two months ago. I had seen the threats. We actually, we monitor for that type of thing. So I had gone to the police two months ago, back in January, and told them, hey, I'm seeing these threats and they're probably gonna call in a fake threat and try to get a SWAT team at my house. And I had to talk my way into the police station because it was late at night. Nobody there knew what to do with this. They're like, well, was it a phone call? Who was it? I mean, what did they say? And so I showed them the website. and. They just kind of shrugged and handed me a piece of paper and were like, write your own police report. So I did. And that is the only reason a SWAT team was not at my front door. It was six cops with their guns holstered. And they even told me the only reason it was that was the situation was because I had told them about this beforehand. Wow, that's a good preventive work, preventative work on your part, preemptive work, I should say. Uh, I, I guess other people should take advice about that. Uh, I, 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 under, I, I know you're not a professional psychologist or anything, but if you had to sort of summarize and characterize what these people are attempting to do by being by behaving this way on the net, is there is there any sort of common ground that you could come with here? Well, I think it's important to note that this isn't specific to Gamergate. Um, the mm -hmm. swatting, I don't know if that was Gamergate or not. So talking about like online trolls in general, um, it's hard to say. I think it's been building up to what we're at right now. I mean, I remember, you know, IRC 20 years ago, um, a little bit different from a different world from what IRC is now, but it was kind of similar to Chan culture, like so 4 chan and 8chan, where people go on these websites and they are completely anonymous. So there's, you know, your usernames don't show up, everybody who posts is anonymous. And the it's just it's a really toxic community. It's a community that promotes, you know, saying horrible things about people and doing terrible things. And this is actually where we've seen a lot of this abuse being perpetuated. So a lot of these SWAT attacks have actually have been planned on the chans. We've seen child porn on the chans and getting any action done on any of this is incredibly difficult. Randy, one of the things that I don't I was curious about is 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 this something that you think is is specifically linked to the gaming community? Is it worse in the gaming community than other areas of of tech? I mean, what you were talking about there with IRC and so on, maybe that already answers that a little bit. But do you think it's worse in in the gaming community than it has been in other areas? I think it's an age thing. So the gaming community, right. typically, what I've seen so far has been mostly dudes who are teenagers, um, some guys in their early 20s. What's really disturbing though, is how many people I've seen posting in Gamergate forums that are CS students. So if it's not our problem yet, it's going to be our problem soon. But it's important to note that while people in tech may not necessarily be calling in SWAT threats, they're perpetuating the culture that lets this happen. Yeah, it, it it certainly seems like a like Randall was saying there. I mean, the thing I don't understand about all this is what the the aim is. I don't understand what the goal is. I mean, just to intimidate people for being another gender. I mean, there's no. It's not like you can say there's a a clear goal or a cause to this. It's not like a liberation movement. It's not something else. So it just seems such a hard thing to understand for me. Maybe that's because I'm fortunate that I haven't obviously haven't suffered this. Well, have you heard the term social justice warrior? Yes. Yeah, I have. Yeah. 
It's pretty much a war against social justice warriors, who, which is the term they put on anybody who says, you know, maybe we shouldn't actually be jerks like this to minorities or just, you know, anybody who is active and speaks out and has an opinion. They want to see those people be quiet. Their goal is to silence those people and to scare away anybody who, you know, might be speaking about these uh, speaking out about these issues. Uh, okay, so in these different forums, people are conversing back and forth in, in, fairly publicly because you have to to enroll new members and, and get more people aligned with what you're doing. Uh, is this mostly happening on 4chan and stuff, or are, are, is Twitter being used to enroll new people? Um, we see a lot on Twitter. Um, Twitter was really popular back in August and September, although it's still horrible, but it's not anywhere near what it was. Um, we see it a lot on 8chan. There's a subreddit for it. I mean, there are a lot of different places where they where they congregate, and they're kind of like these sub communities inside Gamergate. Um, HN, like definitely being one of them, they have the Gamergate board, and they have the board where they uh, do a lot of these swatting and doxing attempts. And we've actually found people, we've identified people in that thread who are definitely active members of Gamergate on Twitter. Um, Twitter has been the biggest pain point because it's a it's a really big culture clash. You have people who are coming over with Chan culture, so you know they're used to doing what they term posting. Sorry about the language, but that is the term they use. Mm -hmm. And it's just, they feel like they sh they should be listened to by everyone. So, you know, normally you're, you're on Twitter and you you probably are having a conversation with friends or using it to like get the word out about something. But generally you kind of stay within your own social circle. I mean, you might see retweets come in from outside your network and you might follow those people or promote those tweets. But usually people are kind of insular, even on Twitter. And here we see people who would start talking about a certain issue, like say, you know, ethics or feminism. And suddenly there's about 300 people that descend on them on Twitter. And Twitter lacks the filtering mechanisms to allow you to block out any of that abuse. Or, and you so know, any you, of just that volume. And what did you do to sort of combat some of that with regard to Gamergate? Um, well, the short version of the story is I got drunk and wrote a 200-line Perl script which broke the internet. <laughs> um, I was going to be going to BlizzCon, which is this gaming conference, which if you see the poster behind me, that is from BlizzCon. And it's one of my favorite things to do every year. It's about World of Warcraft and these games that I love. And I was going to be going there, but this was two months after I had first kind of stepped into this Gamergate disaster. And every morning when I woke up, I would, you know, have my cup of coffee, get on my computer, check my email and check Twitter. And I would look at my Twitter mentions and it would be just so much hate. People telling me to kill myself, people insulting me, people just doing all these, saying all these terrible things. And while, yeah, some people would say it's just words, when you're constantly under siege like that, it takes a really big toll. So I was like, I want to go to BlizzCon and I want to enjoy my experience the way I always do. So what could I do about that? So I come home from work one night and I have a drink of tequila and I decide, okay, I'm going to find a way to actually block all of these people. So I started looking at a lot of the people who were tweeting at me and I saw, okay, these are the people they have in common that they're retweeting. And I went onto those timelines. Oh, wow. Okay. They're the people who are inciting these other people getting attacked. Everybody is following these people. So I looked at the net Twitter module for Pearl and I used that to pull down follower lists of each of these kind of figureheads of, of Gamergate. And then it would look at all these follower lists. And if somebody was following more than one, it would add them to a block list. And then I shared that block list via Block Together, which is a tool that's written by Jacob, who is an ex-Twitter employee and current EFF employee, and allows me to block it on one of my accounts. And then that's where thousands of people have now signed up to you know, use this block list. So essentially, you started with a seed of the people that were being the most abusive to you. And then you're now adding to that somewhat automatically, apparently, anybody who follows two or more of them. Is that, do I understand that right? Yeah, although now um, I have the community version of GG Autoblocker, which is available on GitHub. I'm going to be posting the version I'm currently using soon, um, but it relies on some code, which I'm, isn't quite ready for release. And that's the source list. I wanted, 
I wanted something that wasn't going to take necessarily my opinion into it because that is bias and I'm trying to make this, you know, statistically generated. So I started watching the Gamergate hashtag and I wrote this program that would kind of monitor this hashtag and monitor um, Gamergate's primary targets. So like Anita, Brianna, Zoe, SRH, myself. And it would also monitor some of the people who I thought were the figureheads of Gamergate. And based on that, like who was getting the most retweets, who was targeting, you know, the primary targets of Gamergate the most, I was able to generate a dynamic source list. So every time I rerun the program, um, which I need to turn into a daemon, but I haven't done so yet. Um, it looks at these statistics and it generates a new source list. So it'll then compare followers for those. And the interesting thing is I have about a source list, I think of 12 people, but if I make it four people, the block list doesn't really change much. Mm hmm, that's interesting. Okay, so now the, the result of being on that block list for the, the few thousand people that are subscribed to that is that if I subscribe to that, for example, I would not see anybody... Uh, that is in that list. Uh, mm -hmm. is it ever, has it ever falsely targeted people that way? I mean, do you ever sometimes block people that you shouldn't? Um, occasionally. So we did notice that there are some automatic follow-back accounts, like KFC was a major one that Gamergators were laughing about. I mean, personally, I don't really care that much about fried chicken on Twitter, but some people <laughs> do. So um, I decided to start a whitelisting policy. But then as the request started coming in, I was working full time. And also I, I felt like I was really biased because I was one of the people being targeted. So I put together an appeals board. And these are people from inside and outside of the industry. Like we actually have a, a minister who was on the appeals board and just people who are very diverse. And they put together a document which says, okay, if you are guilty of, you know, sea lioning someone, which is when you just kind of pop into their mentions and do this repeatedly, or when you're uh, victim blaming, or, you know, they put together a list of these are the things that will keep you on the list. If you don't match any of these things in your recent timeline, then we'll go ahead and approve this. And one of them actually has commit access to the GitHub repo so he can update the whitelist. And then um, next time I run the auto blocker, it unblocks these people. Yeah, I actually uh, read about uh, 10 or 12 of the appeals, and they all seem very reasonable. Uh, now, the problem, of course, is how would you know you're on the block list if you, uh, unless, you, unless you go to some specific place to see if, it's, if you're there? Um, so I actually have a Markov bot on Twitter, and that's the account that is running all of the block list. So you can just go check out this Markov bot, which is Randy underscore ebooks, and if it's blocking you, you're on the block list. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, that's pretty simple then. But I have heard complaints from people saying you, you block and there's no appeals process, but that's completely uh, erroneous from what we just heard. So um, Yeah, it's uh, but on the website too. So I'm not really sure like if people didn't read the documentation because that never happens. <laughs> right, yes. Everybody always yeah. reads everything true. Um, so, uh, okay, I'm, I think we're mostly done with, with the, the GG blocker and things like that. Is there anything else you want to say about that before we move on to, the, to your foundation? Um, not really, no. Um, it's... 3,000 was the last number I looked at. Um, I know it's still growing. We're actually working on a version that's going to mute users because we ran into a circumstance where some companies were starting to use the block list because they were getting harassed so much online. And people have figured out they were using the block list and suddenly it turned into a PR nightmare. So we're looking at an auto muting version, which doesn't really show people. Mm. Hmm. So, so we've we've mentioned a little bit uh, in in the introduction there about the foundation, but we haven't really covered that in any detail yet. So, can you tell us a bit about the the foundation that's been set up, um, where it came, you know, how it came to be set up, and, and the process behind that? Yeah. So um, <laughs> the story of it is, I was laid off. Um, it was back in January, and. Two weeks before that, I was thinking, you know, I really like the work I'm doing. Like, this is really cool. I'm getting to examine, you know, the data behind abuse and I'm getting to help people. But all of the skills I'm building up here, I'll never actually be able to make a living from that because any anytime I talk about, like, you know, social networking data analysis, you're mostly looking at marketing companies. And that is not what I wanted to do with my life. Um, mm -hmm. So I decided kind of on the BART ride home that, you know, this is something I'm going to try to do full time because I have this opportunity now. Um, there's a need and I have the experience for it. So maybe I should go ahead and just see if this how this works out. So I went and I talked to people and ended up talking to a lawyer. And he's actually the one who suggested I start an org. So I started thinking about it and talking to other um, activism orgs and tech orgs. And I decided it was a good idea because there's a lot that needs to be done and it's way too much for any one person. So I kind of put together a board and my board is amazing. And what we're looking at doing 
the purpose of all of this, um, there's quite a few aspects of this. One is going to be the prevention and mitigation of abuse. So that's very, very broad. It has to do with dealing with tech companies directly, both to promote the developer policies to make it uh, more easy for communities to, to develop tools like GG Autoblocker. And, oops, and um, whenever we talk to the tech companies, we can also make suggestions for how they could handle abuse, but with engineering concerns in mind. So not going in there and making suggestions, which would be like thousands of man hours. Um, so we've already been talking to a few tech companies privately. We've been able to help them out and that's been great because mm -hmm. it's people feel like they're all alone in this. When I talk to people who are running social media and companies, they have no, I, I mean, they don't know how to deal with this. Everybody's kind of waiting to see how Twitter deals with it because they're the highest profile company who's under attack for how they handle abuse. Mm -hmm. um, so we're also putting together, you know, sort of a, it's going to be a group where people who act, are in these positions at companies can go and talk about their abuse, uh, talk about the abuse they're under and um, how companies can possibly manage it together. And that's mostly targeted at small companies. So kind of spearheading that. Um, we're going to be creating open source tools, kind of similar to GG Autoblocker, things that users can use as well. So they can help shape their online experience. Um, so that's more of the mitigation aspect. Um, another thing that's coming up is we're probably going to be looking at working with law enforcement soon and dealing with, you know, educating law enforcement on online harassment. So there's a lot happening here. And right now it's kind of a matter of what we can prioritize. Mm. And, and uh, obviously, that's one thing I wanted to ask about. This is such an incredibly time-consuming thing and all the work that you're putting into it. Um, obviously, you were saying that it, it's, it's hard to do on your own, so it must be great to have some support and have other people that can come together and, and make this thing happen. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, you know, one of the best things to come out of Gamergate is the fact that all of us found each other because none of us knew each other before this. I mean, I think Brianna and Zoe and Anita might have known each other, um, but quite a few people who are starting to step up and talk about online harassment. We found each other when we told our stories, when we went online and started being active and, you know, speaking out. Now we have this great supportive community and it's, it's really helpful because it's, it's completely normal for women who are under abuse to blame themselves or to think that, you know, it's not actually that serious and it's not that bad until it becomes so bad that, you know, they don't want to be around anymore. So, having these people being able to help advise me and also seeing the way the tech industry has reacted and having the tech industry help and help advise me is just, it's, it's amazing. I think this is like the right time and the right place to be working on this. Mm. And you mentioned having the tech industry involved as well. That was one thing I was curious about is um, are people in this country as well, in the UK, there's been a lot of high profile celebrities and other people who've had a lot of death threats through Twitter and similar. Um, and, and they've, lots of them come out and said, Twitter are doing nothing about this. They're not helping us. They don't want to talk about it. How have you found the uh, Twitter and other people in engaging in this? Are they interested? Do they want to do something about it? Oh, Twitter is really invested in trying to, you know, find better solutions for this problem. Del Harvey is the head of their safety department. She's amazing. I have talked to her before. Um, I think Twitter's in a really difficult position because what they're dealing with isn't really something new, um, but they're the highest profile of it. So they're expected to find a solution. And there is no easy solution for this. Um, there's a lot that they could do better. And I think they're moving towards that slowly, but they're also a, kind of getting to be this giant, monstrosity of a company. So making any sort of move does mm. take time, but we're seeing them like they're, they're making changes based on the community, which is what they've historically done. I mean, if you look at mentions and hashtags on Twitter, those were actually community suggestions. So we should be able to continue like making these suggestions to Twitter. And I think they're taking them to heart. Excellent. Well, that's really good to hear. Um, getting back to the, the foundation and so on, um, a lot of people have mentioned in, in articles and other things, a thing called Crash Override, which I've got to confess, I don't know a hell of a lot about. So what is Crash Override and how does it relate to, to what you guys are doing? So Crash Override was started by Zoe and Alex, and they're also two members on my board. And Crash Override deals more with the victims of harassment. Um, so they provide, you know, the emotional support if you have been doxxed and targeted. They will help you, like, tell you how to scrub your online identity so you can remove any identifying information, like your address from online. They provide a lot of documentation on, like, how to talk to the police, um, how to talk to, you know, your loved ones and tell them, by the way, you know, I have this 
this internet hate mob after me and they're probably going to come after you too because you know me. And that's a really hard conversation to have. So it's, they're a really good resource specifically for people who are being targeted. Mm. And um, we've mentioned, sorry, sorry, I interrupted you there. I was just going to say, we mentioned the term doxing quite a lot, but I'm not sure everybody would know what that actually means. So can, can you just quickly tell us what doxing means for anyone who doesn't know? So doxing is whenever someone posts the personal information, like your address or, you know, even possibly your name, if you're going anonymously, your personal information online with, a, with the purpose of harassing you. So, you know, say my address is technically, you know, anybody could find it. You can do a who is on my domain. But if somebody was to post this on Twitter, like saying, you know, somebody should send her something that isn't nice, that would be considered doxing. Ah, excellent. Okay. It's just to give a bit of context, because I imagine a lot of people are unfamiliar with the, the terminology. There's so much terminology around all of this. Um, so what about other things other than, than like the whole Gamergate situation? Are you, are you interested in, in the organization getting involved in other, in other things as well? Well, like I said, Gamergate's a much, much, it's a, it's a very small part of a much bigger problem. Um, so we've been looking at various other groups out there that have been sources of contention for many people. Um, so for example, TERFs, trans exclusionary rad femmes, uh, these are people who go out and harass trans people on Twitter. So we're trying to put together, you know, block lists for that and see how that abuse works. We've actually done some work looking at real terrorism and how, uh, well, some terrorist groups use social media um, looking at their patterns and how they kind of branch out because someone came to me and said, hey, by the way, uh, this terrorist organization is sending out this link. And if you click on it on Twitter, it installs a like a, a node for a botnet onto your computer. Please help. Mm. So we've been looking at a lot of that. I mean, there's a lot of different groups out there that are kind of creating problems for a lot of people. So finding a way to at least mitigate that until we find better ways to attack the solution is a first step. Mm. And and we talked a bit about tech companies and their response to this and their the amount they're, they're willing to help. How about like law enforcement and so on? Because you mentioned the whole SWAT thing. Um, is there something that, that, you know, that people can do? You mentioned you'd already warned the police this might happen, but uh, is there something people can do? How's their kind of response? How's the kind of law enforcement response to all this? It's very difficult and it's varied. It really depends on the police station you're going to, the officer you're talking to. So I come from a place of privilege. I am a white girl with a golden retriever in a nice part of Oakland. So mm. with that, I mean, I don't really have to worry so much about cops looking at me and possibly harassing me as much as they would say, if I had been a black guy, this whole incident would have happened completely differently. Mm. And so that is something to keep in mind. I mean, even just a white guy would probably have more problems than I did. So it's a difficult thing, which is why Crash Override and I are both willing to help people talk to their police stations um, if they do have problems. We're working on actually creating training documentation that will be issued to police, first starting locally, um, then going out to the rest of California, then hopefully taking this on a national campaign. And that'll be dealing with the issues of online harassment. So what these terms are, like doxing and swatting, because a lot of police officers have no idea what swatting is. And we're also looking at possibly trying to get legal counsel so we can put together various information on state laws and how it relates to cyber stalking and cyber harassment, because every state has different laws. Um, so starting with California once again and working our way out from there. And it's going mm. to be a really long process, but we've gotten really good feedback so far. So I think that this is a place where we're going to be able to kind of step in and help. Mm. And, and you mentioned the difference in state laws because it's so complicated over there. You guys have got so many different laws between different states. How does this work internationally? You just obviously you've got to focus on, on where you guys are right now. But is there anything going on internationally, maybe in other countries, other parts of the world to help support this? So I haven't really looked at other countries so far. I've had people like sending me emails, like talking about how, you know, they think it's crazy that American police have so many guns and they're willing to use them on people. But I haven't really received like any information yet on various other problems that people are having in, in, in other countries. Um, I do know that quite a few of the threats we've received have come from other countries, from every indication we've seen, which is kind of surprising. So uh, but getting back to the organization, getting back to OAPI, the thing that we're actually sort of uh, really talking about on the show, what, what are the outputs of this? You've got, you, see you talked about documents. Uh, are you also going to maybe you're writing some software? Uh, and, and how can people participate on that? 
Okay, so we're actually, um, this is going to be the first time talking about it, but we've been talking for a while about a new software project we're going to be starting where we're going to be accepting volunteers as this is going to be an open source project. And that's Project Carlton, which is named after a Marvel superhero um, whose name is Hindsight. So what this is, is it's a web app and you'll be able to go to this web app and authenticate via Twitter or Facebook to start an account there. And it's an online harassment profile. So whenever you receive a harassing tweet or a harassing post on Facebook or an email or pretty much any website anywhere, you'll be able to log it on this website. And this is really important because whenever you get harassed, it's usually not just over, you know, one website, it's over different forms of media and knowing just how to store that and to keep the identifying information to where if you need to go to law enforcement, you'll have that information available. It's not an easy thing for anybody who's not, you know, technical and hasn't already dealt with this stuff. Nobody should have to know the uh, police policies or the law enforcement policies for each of these tech companies and the different, uh, information that's needed. So this will be kind of a big online repository. And whenever you're ready to go to the police, you'll be able to like click a button, it'll download a PDF. And this PDF will have copies of all the harassing stuff you've received from a specific, from a specific person, along with all the identifying information that's needed for anyone to go to, to law enforcement. And law enforcement can contact Twitter, Facebook, whoever, and say, you know, we need the information for this tweet ID or this user ID. Um, along with, you know, it'll, that way law enforcement will also know who to talk to. So it's just a really easy way to kind of keep a repository of your abuse and store it so you don't have to keep it on your computer and keep looking at it. Uh, I, I'm a little concerned, though. Is, is, this, is this private? So basically I would have my own profile there and what I mm -hmm. post would, wouldn't be seen by anybody else? Absolutely. Um, it's only for you. So your information is private. Um, right now, we're still looking at privacy implications. So we're going to be talking to a few organizations that deal specifically with online privacy um, while we decide how to go forward with this. Uh, tentatively, we're looking at having two different options whenever you sign up. One is going to be that we can use your data anonymized for statistical analysis, which will help us look and see where the abuse is coming from, um, which is a really valuable thing to know because we're seeing abuse move from platform to platform and from one group to another, like the different types of abuse that are received. And the other option you can sign up for would be that if some, like whenever a person's targeted, chances are the person that is harassing them is not harassing just them. They're probably harassing multiple people. And if one of those people decides to go to the police, can the police request a copy of this data as well if they request like the complete harassment profile of that harasser? But people have to opt into that. Um, we need to be really, really careful and very concerned about security and privacy in this type of situation. Exactly. I mean, yeah, we'll definitely be concerned about that. Uh, so uh, again, in the practical terms of my audience here, our audience together, um, what kinds of people are you looking for to help you with, with uh, Carlton? Um, we're still kind of defining it on a technical aspect. Right now we're looking at like, for example, Google App Engine. Um, we're definitely looking for privacy experts. Google actually has some really good InfoSec people. And that's one of the reasons we're looking at App Engine because we know that this is going to be a target for Black Hat and it's going to be a target for DDoS and pretty much anything bad that you can think of happening is going to be targeted at us. Um, so we're definitely looking for developers. We're still kind of defining how this is going to be laid out. Um, right now, looking at possibly like Ruby or Python as far as a framework goes. But we're going to have posts up later about different volunteer positions we're going to have open, and that'll be on onlineabuseprevention.org. And are you, are you also going to have uh, directories or at least uh, links to places that would tell people more about what's really going on instead of, I mean, we even have some people in the chat room be, appear somewhat naive about the magnitude of this. Is, are there places that you or I can direct people to to see more about the scope of what's actually going on in the world? Just for online harassment in general? Yeah. Well, we're going to be trying to provide those resources ourselves um, okay. as we receive like more posts. For example, I saw a post coming on Medium today that was just amazing. Um, I'm going to start posting those to uh, our website as well. Just kind of so people, it's there usually aren't large repositories of this is how abuse is happening. Um, usually it's one or two stories here and there. And finding a place where people can can easily 
get the support and not be worried about like a list. If you have a list of people who have been abused, they're going to be abused more because people will find them. They'll be like easy victims, Ugh. which is a problem we've seen before. So you have to be really careful about how that's done. Um, we can give general information, but like, for example, putting on names of people and linking, having like this big list of links of people who have talked about it could be problematic. Now, is this, you know, I, I don't want to sound too cynical here, but isn't this somewhat inherent in the way people are brought up and raised and, and the, the not anonymity, whatever that word is, uh, on the internet? I mean, how, will, will, there, will you reach a goal at the end of this? That's a really, really hard question to answer. I don't think online harassment is ever going to completely go away, but I think we can handle it better and provide a more supportive environment for people and find better ways to, you know, mitigate and prevent this online abuse. But people, some people are going to be jerks. What we can do is make it harder for them to be jerks. And that's kind of what we're shooting for right now. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 been a continual problem. I mean, ever, ever, you know, ever since tech has been around, and probably even long before that. I don't know. I don't know if, there, if bakers and and doctors have the same sort of things, but uh, it's it's um, I've seen it happen firsthand, and I've read a lot of stories about it, and uh, it's 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 a it's a interesting subject to me personally as well, um, because I, I you know I'm sort of an armchair psychologist from time to time as well, trying to understand really get inside the minds of all these people, um, specifically about uh, um, what's what you done so far uh do you think uh being as public as you've been about this and the risks that you took doing that that you've made a difference to people out there and if so how i've received so many emails and so many tweets on twitter and so many blog comments where women were thanking me for telling my story because they couldn't and that made it all worth it i mean for me personally what i had to do was make myself public because i was doxxed whenever i was 15 I mean, I've been dealing with online harassment for 20 years. This put me in a very unique situation of being exceptionally stubborn and also very loud. <laughs> so um, I wouldn't recommend that, you know, people do what I've done unless they have that personality aspect because it's mm -hmm. really, really hard. It's exhausting and it's emotionally intense in a way that's really difficult to describe unless you've been through it. So, so one thing I, I'm curious about is um, we mentioned this is not going to go away, and, and I think we can all pretty safely, if, if we were gambling people, I think we could safely put some money on the fact that this is not going to go away anytime soon, if ever. Um, but what are your plans for the future of the, of the foundation? And, and uh, is there anything like coming up apart from Project Carlton that you want to tell us about? Um, it's mostly Project Carlton at this point. Like I said, we do have a limited number of people as we get more used to running an organization, because this is really weird for somebody who's a DevOps engineer to come in and start trying to run an open source project in a company. Um, as we get more up to speed on how to manage these types of things, I think we're going to be rolling out more volunteer positions as funding comes up, possibly even maybe taking on employees. We're not really sure yet. Mm -hmm. um, but the more people we get involved, the more we can do. Uh, the big thing right now is Project Carlton and also creating that uh, documentation for police stations is definitely one of our top priorities. Uh, I think it's really important because for Project Carlton to be useful, law enforcement needs to know how to react to these issues. Um, that's primarily what we're working on right now. But also we've been kind of going in and talking to various tech companies here and there who are dealing with abuse problems. So we're still open to conversations with companies that need help. And, and how do people get involved? So people are watching this and they think, I really want to help. I want to get involved in that. How do they, how do they come on and get involved with, with what you're up to? Well, one way is through volunteering through open source. So if you're a developer and you'd like to contribute to this, we're going to have um, listings up later of more technical aspects of how this is being worked on. And we'll definitely be taking a list of volunteers and creating a mailing list and a whole project around this. Um, so that's a really good way to get involved. Also, there is the financial consideration. So we're still kind of going through all of the paperwork to get our 501c3, which makes us a nonprofit, which if you can ever avoid doing this, just don't, don't do it. It's so much paperwork and I'm really glad we have a lawyer, but it takes a while. So we're not quite at that point yet. People can't make donations to the org yet. Um, personally, if I'm bankrolling this whole thing through my Patreon and my 401k, 
So if people really want to help out now mm. prior to that, I mean, they can always go to my Patreon, which is linked on my Twitter. I'm, I'm actually curious why you, you just use one of the umbrella organizations like uh, SFC or something like that, because that would have had all the 501c3 stuff done for you already. I feel like if we use an umbrella corporation, I haven't worked with any of these people before. Ah. And I'm concerned about their priorities being different from our priorities. And we have a lot of flexibility right now and a lot of ability to empower change, which is really good. But I need to make sure that, you know, we're staying on the right track and that I can go out and say the things I want to say and do the things I want to do without a larger company saying, well, that's not really along the lines of what we had intended for you. So it's just kind of having the flexibility to do our own thing. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the you know the, the, these organizations got their 501c3 by having some sort of charter, and something like the OAPI might not necessarily fall within that charter uh, if they're mostly about open source. So I can see the difficulty of that, and I, I'm, I'm glad that you're actually taking your, your own initiative to make yourself uh, available for donations. Uh, and also, uh, you should go, keep in mind that uh, corporations doesn't matter whether it's 501c3 or not. So you can solicit uh, donations from corporations, and they can still write it off. So uh, keep that in mind as well. Uh, you know, we're almost out of time. Oh, I had one other question from the chat room. Uh, you may or may not know about this, but Padre SJ apparently had his own Twitter blocker. Were you familiar with that one? Padre SJ? Padre SJ. He's the guy that does the, uh, he does, he's, he's another Twit host. He does uh, the uh, Cody 101 show. Oh, no, I haven't seen that. He's, uh, he's talked about it apparently numerous times. I, I don't watch Cody 101 because I'm Coding two one already, uh, but so, uh, but uh, apparently he's mentioned it a few times. But uh, we'll just we'll just leave it at that. That if you don't know anything about it, uh, because they, they asked if you had modeled yours based on Padre SJ's, but apparently no, because you didn't even know who Padre SJ was. So uh, I guess that answers that question. Is there anything else? Because we're like I said, we're wrapping up here. Is there anything else you want to make sure our audience is aware of that we didn't actually get to in this show? Um, I think we pretty much covered the main topics, but definitely keep an eye on OAPI's Twitter, which is join underscore OAPI. Um, keep an eye on our website. We'll be making more announcements there. I kind of make other announcements on my personal site, which is blog.randy.io. And so most of those are OAPI related. They just aren't really something we want to put on the corporate site because it's more of a personal aspect of what we're doing. But yeah, keep an eye out. Um, I think we're going to have a lot of news coming up pretty soon. Great, great, and uh, uh, that's 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 wonderful. Um, I have to ask you the two questions because so many people <laughs> yell at me anyway. So I think I know the answer to a couple of these. Uh, what's your favorite scripting language? Ruby. Oh no no no! <laughs> you did the bot in Perl. I thought if you did the bot in Perl, the Perl it was in Perl. But you know, what? I had to learn Ruby because Perl didn't have a good module for a Twitter streaming API. Oh, so um, the new one's in Ruby, huh? Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. All right, and your favorite text editor? Vim. <laughs> Shot down by my own peeps, man. My own. Peeps. You knew I would answer this way. I know. You did this five years ago. <laughs> Already, very brave things that you're doing. Really appreciate the the contribution you're making to the community at large. Uh, and I know some the personal risks uh, people are taking. You know, it, you get harassing emails all the time. In fact, this show even got a couple pieces of harassing emails. We were announcing the show, so uh, I, I totally understand. I totally respect what you're doing and the, the the bravery and the contribution that you're making. So thank you for coming on the show and talking about what you're currently up to about this and letting us into more insight into what's actually happening out there. Yeah, thanks so much for having me here. This was great, and I'm so glad I got to talk to you about it. Very good, very good. That was Randy Harper, our own Randy Harper, FreeBSD girl, uh, talking about the OAPI and about what's been happening uh, with respect to her and Gamergate and all these other related things. What do you think, Dan? Yeah, I, I was just going to echo what you said about the whole uh, the bravery thing. I mean, it's great that, that people like Randy are out there, you know, being prepared to stand up and, and say something because it's difficult. It, it takes a lot of bravery to stick your head above the parapet and say, hang on, this is wrong and someone needs to do something. So I just applaud what they're doing and they're... Uh, if anyone can help, anyone wants to get involved, um, obviously you know the address now, so go and check it out. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, speaking of upcoming guests, I didn't really speak of that, but I am now. Hey, you know, I sent out a flurry of emails over the last week, and we have five new committed guests for the upcoming shows. In fact, we almost have a solid schedule for the next eight weeks or so. <laughs> this is really good. Yay, finally, Randall did it. Randall did it. So next <laughs> week we have uh, Mohid, which is a water modeling system used for uh, physical analysis of water and water flow and groundwater and things like that. That should be sort of interesting. There's lots of software, like maybe some nice animations and stuff. Uh, just added to the schedule, Pod love 
I love the name, Podlove. Uh, it's, mm. uh, their, their banner line is they're improving the overall technical infrastructure for podcasting. So they're coming up with all these ways to have like a subscribe to this uh, podcast button and it automatically does the right things based on what operating system you're on and gives you cho choices like iTunes if you're on a Mac, things like that. It looks pretty cool, but it's a pretty infant project, but they're looking at for more supporters. And because about podcasting, it'd be like a meta show, which would be a really cool tool. Also uh, newly added to the schedule is, I don't know how to pronounce this, C-R-I-U. But it is a checkpoint restore functionality for Linux in user space. So out of the OpenVZ project, they're actually making it possible to shut down a, a user space thing, migrate it somewhere else, and come up. So it'll be really nice. Um, uh, another one also just added, and I'm pr really excited by this. Uh, I'm all into Agile now. I'm, I'm not very good at it yet because the companies that I'm at usually don't uh, don't actually apply it properly. But uh, theoretically, I'm really into uh, 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 all these all this Agile stuff. Uh, Tygo.io, it's a new thing, still sort of in beta, but it's a beautiful set of Scrum tools, uh, 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 Kanban boards, uh, problem tracking things, burn down charts, everything you need to manage stuff with with, uh, with uh, Agile. And uh, uh, they're just getting started, as I said, but it's beautiful too. It's all written in AngularJS. So all the transitions are really smart looking and things slide around on the screen and you drag and drop stuff to put on there. So I'm looking forward to that. I may even be using it on a project starting next week. So that'll be even interesting as well. So um, also added to the schedule, just added to the schedule, Deviation TX, which is kind of a narrow application, but it's a replacement firmware for the Wall. Kara Devo series of RC uh, airplanes and transmitters. So um, it's a small project, a couple guys working on it, but I thought it might be interesting to have something odd and physical, like well, we don't always do stuff like that. Also added to the show is Lucy. Lucy uh, is the open implementation of uh, CFML. That's a Cold Fusion Markup Language, I think it is. So it's a big Java application, and it basically implements CFML, and that's going to come on soon. On the very short list, people who just said, okay, I'll get back to you with a date, uh, we just added to the very short list the Koha ILS. That's an open source library management system. I'm going to have them compare themselves with Evergreen, which uh, we talked about, uh, talked to it a few years ago. We also have Tulip, which are Tulip, Tulip, which is uh, also a agile thing. It's an application lifecycle management stuff. Uh, and also added this really short list. We, uh, we're going to go back and bring the Dart guys back on because Dart has changed quite a bit in the few years since they've been on the show including the new announcement that uh, Google is not actually going to build uh, the Dart VM into Chrome, and that is going to force the Dart team to get better and better JavaScript out of their stuff, which is actually good for all of us because you don't have to be running just Chrome. It'll actually work everywhere better because of better JavaScript. Uh, also, I mentioned AngularJS a moment ago. Uh, Seth Ladd is hooking me up with the AngularJS team at Google, so we'll have them on to talk about their uh, full uh, client-side uh, uh, application uh, creation uh, stuff in JavaScript, so that'll be fun as well. Um, again, you can see all the actions I'm taking uh, by going to the big spreadsheet. It's listed from uh, twit.tv slash floss, which is our homepage. Uh, the big spreadsheet is listed there. Uh, as always, if you, don't, if, you, if you don't see somebody, if you, if you have somebody in mind, you don't see them on the list, there we go. <laughs> uh, email me, Merlin at stonehenge.com, or have the project leader email me at Merlin at stonehenge.com. You can follow us at Floss Weekly at, on Google+. Plus. You can also... Um, uh, you can also uh, follow us, Floss Weekly, the uh, the Twitter handle. Uh, we had a live chat. We took a few questions uh, from here. Um, I'm getting all sorts of pinging at my face here. I don't know what's going on. Um, and you follow me at Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N. And uh, you can also um, uh, follow me on Google Plus at Randall L. Schwartz. Uh, I'm going to be at Yapsy North America in Salt Lake City in early June. Uh, and that's about all the things I want to plug. Dan, you got some stuff to plug? Um, well, yeah, I mean, as people probably know, um, Linux Outlaws is, is uh, sadly now defunct, but I am still podcasting. So if you're interested in Creative Commons music um, or any uh, independent music and stuff, you can check out, uh, if you head to danlynch.org, which is at the bottom of the screen there, if you're watching, uh, you can find links to various podcasts that I'm doing and blogs and so on. So just head there and find all those other links that you need. Awesome, awesome. Well, like I said, we're just wrapping it up here, and we have a bunch of new guests already lined up on the show, so I'm really happy. Finally, again, I was sort of looking a little little light there, so um, I'm trying to think of there's anything else I need to say about the show. I'm really, again, really happy Randy came on the show and got to talk about this, and uh, I guess we'll see you all again next time on Floss Weekly. Floss Weekly.